Okay, I think we are, uh, we're ready to start. So We're all set. <laughs> Greg Fink. Uh, Thank sexy, you for being here. Sexy and handsome French photographer. I didn't write yeah, it. Yeah, he actually added it to my notes. Yeah, I added it. <laughs> Featured on Style Me Pretty and Wedding Sparrow. Named on Harper Bazaar's Wedding Phot Photogs of the Year 2016. So congratulations. Thank you. His third annual workshop in France is coming up in May. We were talking about Pearl Jam earlier. He's the biggest Pearl Jam fan I know. He likes long walks on the beach and drinking champagne from women's shoes. <laughs> okay, if you want to know more about that, just come and see me tonight. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your story, how you uh, got into photography. Um, so basically, I've always been a photographer. I got my first camera in the end when I was 12. I was lucky enough to have a dark room at home when I was a kid because my dad just loved that. So he taught me how to process my negatives, how to do my prints. So I've always done that. But then my parents told me that I should get a real job. So I met a business school and I worked 10 years for Procter & Gamble as a marketing manager in Paris. And uh, I was kind of very sad in that life. So I started sh shooting weddings seven years ago when I was still working another job, uh, first for friends, then friends of friends. And as of a sudden, you realize you can have a market. So I quit my job three years ago, so I've been full-time since. I always tell this story to people that are just starting out. Um, I was really impressed when we first started working together. I remember you wanted to do the, the book project, and the way you went about it was completely different than other clients do, where you told me, this is my budget for the book. This is what I'm looking for. How many books can I get? as opposed to most people who will say, okay, I need a hundred of this book, and then we give them the price. So I thought that that was really impressive. Um, can you kind of explain a little, talk a little bit about how your prior experience in business has helped your photography business? Yeah, so my prior experience in business really helps on a daily basis, whether it is branding or accounting, managing a P&L, everything. And you need to realize that 70% of photographers, wedding photographers, are going to be out of the market in three years, 70%. And in 10 years, only I think it's 2 or 3%, 2 yeah. that are still going to be on the market after 10 years. And the main reason of that is that because people don't make money out of it. So, of course, it's a passion. And of course, your first driver needs to be the passion for photography and for people because you're shooting weddings. But you still need to make money out of it. Otherwise, you're going to be out of the market. So it was really important to me. And as I said, I've, I've shot my first wedding seven years ago. I, always, I only went full-time three years ago because that was a long transition to me because I wanted to take the time to sustain my business and be sure that I can make a living out of it. And then when I go to the market, I'm ready for it. And this is financially sustainable. So what business really taught me before is that you cannot invest money and don't expect a return on investment. A lot of people told, tell me, I just bought a contacts, I'm going to shoot Fuji, and I'm going to be a destination fine art photographer, wh whatever that means. And uh, that's great, but you need to be absolutely aware of all of the costs that, that are going to come with it. Because what's expensive is not just buying the contacts, it's Everything that implies after that, like shooting, processing, everything. So when I decided to do these books, uh, that was a marketing investment to me. And I say, okay, what's the budget I can invest on this item this year? Because I have a business plan and I determined it was like, I don't know, $2,000. Um, and I came to Cohen and say, okay, what can I have with that amount of money? And it turned out it was a really random number of books. If I remember correctly, it was like 62. Yeah. <laughs> and then I negotiated for 63, and here we are. <laughs> and then we threw in a free one for 64, and he agreed to speak. So it all, it all worked out. And, after, and a year after that, he told me, oh, by the way, we had 10 remaining. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell the story that you were telling me the other day, kind of touching on what you were talking about, about having to turn a profit when... At one of your workshops, you were reviewing um, with one of the attendees and how she started crying when she figured out that she had actually lost money on a wedding. She didn't realize what was going into that. Yeah. 
What's really important to me with pricing, because most of photographers who come and talk to me are wondering about their pricing. I am not, is it your case? I always like thinking, I am, am, am I cheap enough? I am expensive enough? And everybody's wondering about his pricing. My vision of pricing is that you need to know what amount of money you want to make every year for yourself. And that number is going to be personal to you. Maybe it's going to be 100,000 for you. Maybe it's going to be a million for you. Uh, <laughs> but that number is personal. So I'm no one to tell you your pricing should be five grand, 10 grand, 15 grand. It depends on your number. And from that vision, you're going to implement your pricing then. If let's say you need 100,000 a year and you want to shoot 20 events, that probably means you should have a pricing around 5,000. The problem with photographers today is that they approach pricing by looking at the market and say, oh, I'm going to judge my quality myself. And I think this is quite comparable to this photographer, which is worth like three grand. So I'm going to be at three grand too. And I had this photographer coming to me for a one-on-one -on -one session. And I told her, what is the wedding you're the most excited about in your portfolio? So she shows me that wedding. And I tell her, how much did you charge on that wedding? And she tells me $2,000. I say, how many rolls of film did you shoot? So she gave me the numbers. We make, we make the calculation. And I say, how many assistants did you, did you have? How much did you pay them? And we make the calculation. And I just proved her that she lost $700 on that wedding. And she started crying. Losing money on a wedding is not a problem. What is a problem is not knowing about it. Because everybody can make investments shooting a destination weddings. I mean, sometimes you have this inquiry in Bali, in Thailand, whatever. And you say, okay, let's do a holiday there. So I'm going to compromise on my pricing. And that's fine. That's fine if you have an objective behind it, if you want to develop your portfolio in Asia or whatever, but it's important that you know if you're making money or not. How long before you actually were able to turn, it, turn the business into a profit center as opposed to an investment? Almost five years, five years. And to me, that's the biggest mistake that the wedding photographers do today. Wedding photographer is an amazing job. It's a passion job. You can work from home. You can manage your own schedule. And you have a very few investment needed. The problem is, if you look at the company who succeed, none of them don't invest. If you want to succeed with a company, you need to invest. And the biggest mistake that wedding photographers make is that they, they think that they can work from home just invest like five grand in equipment and they're going to succeed. That doesn't work that way because you're going to need to invest. And I'm not telling you to invest tons of money in marketing, in advertising, because I don't really believe in it, especially except if it's like very focused to your niche market. But my investment was rising my pricing year on year until the moment where I can make a living out of it, which was only last year even though my first wedding was shot seven years ago. So to me, the problem with wedding photographers today who get out of the market is because they didn't plan that. They quit their job. They expect that they're going to make a living out of it in like a year, two years. It doesn't work that way. Look at all of the names you follow on social media and ask yourself for how long these people have been on the market. And most of the time, it's going to be five years, 10 years. Zosia has been here for like 15. And longevity to me is the biggest competitive advantage that you, yeah, that you can have. You cannot succeed to me on that market in just two years. What do you consider to be a healthy profit margin? Once again, that number is going to depend from what you want to make as a living. If you want to make 50 grand per year, or if you want to make 200, that's not the same. But it's really important that when you answer an inquiry and you decide to accept a wedding or not, you know exactly the bottom line. So we had a discussion too. 
shooting a roll of medium format film cost me $29. And that's when you factor in the cost of the shipping, the cost of the film, yeah, and then and, what we and, charge and, you. And I include everything in that, meaning processing, the cost of the film, the cost of ship, shipping from France, any DHL package from Paris cost me $150. So I know that in average, I'm going to include 50 rolls in a package, that $3 per roll on top. So $29 is my number. I want to know on a wedding exactly what's going to left in my pocket, what's going to be left in my pocket at the end of the day. So let's say I'm going to shoot 60 rolls, 70 rolls, 80 rolls times 29 plus the cost of my packaging, plus the cost of my album, plus the cost of shipping my packaging to the clients because I deliver prints. That number at the end of the wedding you need to know exactly what that is. And I'm not here to tell you this is a good margin, this is a bad margin, because that number, once again, needs to be personal, depending on the fact that you're going to shoot 10 weddings a year or 50 weddings a year. But you need to know that number, and not a lot of photographers that I mean know, know that number. Do you go into the wedding with... Because it seems like it's really, it's really thought out, and the kind of a producer's background, do you go in knowing the exact amount of roles that you're going to shoot per wedding or at least have a general idea of how many roles? I do have a general idea. Uh, I don't limit myself because you always have the possibility to have the wedding of the year that very day. And if you have limited yourself to 30 roles, you're going to be really pissed. Um, so I don't limit myself and I always take more roles that not, en that not enough. But what I realized this year, I shot this wedding. It was a $5 million budget wedding. John Legend was at the ceremony, crazy stuff. And um, the wedding planner is putting so much pressure talking about that wedding, like, oh my God, $5 million, John Legend, blah, blah, blah. I shot 200 rolls on that wedding, 200. An average wedding for me is gonna be more like 60. So I shot three times more than a regular wedding. If you look at the final results, it's more like I put pressure on myself just shooting frantically just because there was so much fuzz around that day. And if I look at the best weddings I shot to me that have been published, it's weddings where I've shot like my average like 50, 60 year olds. So I'm not saying you need to limit yourself, but you still need to have your number in mind. You need to know, okay, I am confident in delivering a great wedding with 30 rolls, 50, 80. And if you realize that you're going out of the way, like on a wedding, like shooting 150 or 200, you will realize that most of this photo is just double, triple, and it doesn't make really any sense when on the final product. What are action steps that photographers can take to get to the path of profitability? I think the first one is having a business plan. Too many photographers I meet don't have a business plan. And when I speak about business plan, people are really scared because they imagine that 100 pages booklet. And I'm not speaking about that. I'm just speaking about having a very easy Excel spreadsheet with your numbers which is the, what is the revenue you want to make in 2017? And that revenue is split how? How many events? And once again, let's be really simple. Let's say you want to do 50 grand, you want to shoot 20 weddings. That probably means you're going to need to charge in average 20, 2,500. And that can be as simple as that. And once you have that business plan, you need to do everything to stick to your objectives and targets. People don't like it when I say that, but to me, shooting weddings, I shoot between 25 and 30 weddings per year. So basically, I have 30 clients per year. That's not a lot. I mean, if you like at most companies, they don't have like 30 clients a year. They have many more than that. I have 30 clients per year. Shooting 30 weddings a year to me is execution of my business plan. It's execution. Of course, I love it. But to me, 80% of my job is finding these 30 persons. You said 80% you, you of your job is finding the 30 clients? I, 
I tend to believe that. And people don't really like it because they say, you're a photographer, you need to enjoy shooting weddings, and I do. But if I don't find these 30 persons, I am not shooting anything, I'm not booking, and I will be out of the market. So I try to dedicate 80% of my resources to networking, social media, communicating, featuring, whatever, to find these 30 clients. This is my main objective as a wedding photographer. The so 20% shooting is execution. But that's only my opinion. What has been the most successful to help you find these clients? Relationships with mentors. And that's something else people don't like that I say. I tend to think that my client is the wedding planner. The bride and groom who are going to book me, 100% of my weddings are booked through planners. So the planner is contacting me, usually displays the work to the clients and they say yes or no. The bride and groom, in 99% of the time, have been very happy of the results. And these guys, of course, you can have some word of mouth and uh, the friends of these guys are going to see your album on the coffee table, but they are customers. They're coming once. The wedding planner, if you develop a relationship with them, if they, if they love your quality, if they love your style, if they love your professionalism, first you're going to book one client with them. So year after you're going to book three. So year after you're going to book five. I have these wedding planners in France. We started at the same time, like shooting five years. I mean, she started five years ago. I started shooting five years ago, uh, like real weddings five years ago. Uh, I started seven years ago, but the two first years, it was basically $500 wedding. And we started kind of at the same level. She tested me on one wedding. The year after I had two, last year I had four. This year I have eight. Eight is 30% of my business. I'm shooting 25. That's huge. So sometimes that's scary because I say, oh my God, if I have a problem with that planner, what I'm going to do? But developing these relationships, so first you have one planner you really work well with, then you have two, then you have five. Maybe it's not a planner, it can be a venue. I have five weddings in the same venue this year because they really liked a wedding I shot there like two years ago. So now they refer me to the clients. So to me, the most profitable investment in this industry is to develop these relationships. So I'm not saying you cannot make marketing investments, but it needs to be very focused. The main reason why I did these books is because I wanted to send them to the planners I really work well with. And you don't want to be working with everybody. I mean, I, I had bad experiences with planners. I don't want to work with them anymore, and it's fine. Because once again, all you need, is 30, in my case, is 30 clients per year. And my market is wherever my clients want to fly me. At what point did you feel that your business was healthy enough to start taking on other endeavors, like the workshops and one-on-ones and, -on and that sort of thing? I didn't launch the workshop for telling myself, okay, my business is sustainable enough, so let's do a workshop. Everything that I do in my business needs to be profitable. So the workshop to me was, for ex let's talk about the workshop, it was a way to say, okay, I can add more profit to my business. But I didn't wait for the wedding business to be sustainable because my first workshop that was three years ago and I still didn't make any money out of weddings that back in these days. So what's important is that you monitor every action that you make. And for example, I'm still questioning the workshop today even though it's been the third edition because it's a huge investment in, in terms of timing and I basically don't make a lot of money out of it. So every year I'm like, okay, should I still keep on doing it because it's so much investment in terms of time? What's important is that you can do anything you want as long as it's in line and it serves your branding. The workshop to me, I knew that the first year I would not make any money out of it, but it was the opportunity to me to design my own style shoots. Because usually when you collaborate with planners and style shoots, it's your vision, of course, but it's also theirs. And my, st my workshop was a way for me to say, okay, let's show the world what I can do if I'm the hard director of a style shoot. And that was the main reason why I launched it. So basically, you can do anything as long as it serves your brand and it's profitable. 
So for you, it's twofold. It's the workshop, but also it's the chance to kind of art direct the whole thing. Yeah, because even though I have a mixed feelings about style shoots, they are very difficult today to be featured uh, because there are so many out there. A lot of people do the same thing. And the workshop for me was my, my workshop was also the way to express myself and say, okay, I want to do a style shoot, but I want do, to do it differently. I just don't want it to be the bride and a nice table. So every year I have this like crazy theme going on up nowhere. So for example, without telling any secrets, the next one's going to be Alice in Wonderland because we want to adapt Alice in Wonderland to the wedding industry. And that's going to be so fun and so different. So that was my vision behind the workshop show my vision of what we can do differently, but then you still need to have the profitable side of it in your mind. Because if you don't make any money out of something, you need to have a very good reason to keep on doing it. We have all their business cards, so if anybody steals the Alice in Wonderland idea from you, we'll, we'll know <laughs> how to find them. Um, anybody have any questions for Greg? So, so the question was from Anna, once you had the 62 books, uh, how did you decide who and where you were going to send them to? That's a very good question. And honestly, I was like, oh my God, I could send more than that. But it was a good exercise also because you don't want to be communicating to the math. Because once again, 30 clients a year, where are these people? Where are they going to buy their dress? And for example, let's take Rima as an example. She's a bridal designer. We don't have a single common client. Because most of our market is in France, and the price of our dresses is between four and five thousand dollars. My clients tend to invest more than that in their dress. So, for example, I had this book on her shelf for a year. I didn't book any client out of it. So it was a good exercise for me to say, okay, I have only sixty-two books. What am I going to do with them? So probably thirty-five are going to be two planners. Who are these planners? Am I sure that they operate in my market, which is south of France, Italy? I mean, I can still send one out of the blue in Germany, in London, and maybe it will work, but there are high chances that it won't. But if I'm sending that to the, these planners I don't work with yet, who operate in the south of France, and we're going to see images that speak to him, then maybe that's going to tick. So you want to you want to know where your clients are going for the venue, which planners they're going to be using, which dress they're going to buy. You need to know that. For example, I have a very specific profile of my clients. And if I look at my wedding, 80% of my weddings, it's usually the same type of couple. It's usually between 30 and 35. The groom is older, he might be divorced, he already has kids, they're paying, their job, they're paying their wedding by themselves, he's in finance, usually Wall Street or making tons of money. It's always the same profile. So you need to know where these guys are going to buy their dress, which planner, etc. You don't want to be like sending money because that's money just anywhere. How do I charge for travel? Very easy. I have this Express spreadsheet. The first line is flight. Second line is transfer to airport. Third line is going to be hotel, car, gas, uh, food. I live in France. Sales tax is 20%. So uh, the sum of all of it, I need to add 20%. And the reason why I do that is that for years, I've not charged enough for travel. 2015, I remember the number... I charge 15,000 euros for travel. I spent almost 30, the double. And that's another problem to me for wedding photographers because most of the time they're so scared of like selling their package that they forget that if they don't charge enough travel, that's going to be a huge loss in terms of profits at the end of the wedding. So I'm making this very simple calculation and usually the number is scary. And I had this bride, I just booked a wedding on the, in the south of France, and I had this bride telling the wedding planner, does he fly first class? And I explained to her the calculation. And I don't make any profit out of the travel. But if you add everything, for example, I live in Paris, going to the airport is going to be 60 euros, back 60 euros. Usually that's something you don't have in mind because you just think about the price of the flight. 
You're going to have food on the two days wedding. You're going to need to buy food. If you rent a car, you're going to have toll. You're going to have gas. Everything you need to include. So are you, char- are you up charging uh, if you have to come a day early or anything like that, even though you're not shooting? Time away from home, basically. You no, I don't, charge, I don't charge time away from home, but I shoot five or six weddings a year in the U.S. And for example, I was charging not enough for the U.S. because like staying in the U.S. for three days, basically it cost me like between three and four thousand dollars. And when you think about that number, you say, that's huge. But that's what it actually cost me. But no, I don't charge. If I travel for like five days or time away from home, I don't charge for it. And my pricing for destination wedding, I, I only have one price list. Destination is not more expensive than shooting in Paris. So My cost of travel is not included in my pricing. Because I found it very confusing because I might, I might still have a wedding in Paris. Or south of France, it's an hour flight. I can leave in the morning, be back the other day. That's going to be $700. Compared to if I fly to the US, that's going to be a four four thousand. So I feel bad of integrating just like one average pricing in my, one, an average travel pricing. Do you book all of the travel yourself, the flights, hotels, and I all do. that? But I do. I have a routine. I do. I'm, let's say I'm going to handle that wedding. I'm going to book the flight. I'm going to book the car, the hotel, everything at the same time. I put everything in my calendar, and usually that's done. 